planning to have an uninterrupted electricity and water supply from solar energy in the Gambia and beyond. Worry no more, because Solar Enterprise will provide you with the solutions at reasonable cost. We have experienced personals who can install and advise you about your electricity and water supply with a warranty period. We have good quality solar products from North America and Europe. We provide services and sell products to individuals, organizations, institutions, private offices, communities, and government. These products are solar panels, batteries, charge controllers, inverters, water pump, water heaters, freezers, submissable pumps, and general solar accessories. Visit our stores at 48 Kairaba Avenue and Brusubi Highway, or you can call us on 7657-479. 9808483-340-9400 or 6359906. of owning your dream homes. EJ Investment is here for you. Secure our quality bungalows with two, three, or four bedrooms or our story building, three or four to five bedrooms at very affordable prices with flexible payment plans at our Sanyang Sea View Estate where you can enjoy the cool breeze with modern infrastructure such as the roads, covered drainage system, modern electrification with street lights, gated entrance with security posts, and social amenities such as gas station, shopping mall, medical clinic, park, schools, children daycare, and a lot more. Our dedicated team of professionals will keep the estate clean at all times, provide security and patrol team within the estate premises, install latest technologies such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, home network installation, sonar panel, and power backup system. Also, check out for our additional home facilities and interior design service, such as premium tiling, wall plaster, home landscape, fingerprint home lock, and a lot more. Visit our office at Senegambia Kololi Highway and get a free site visit tour or contact us on 4464-838. WhatsApp us on 3259-220 or you can visit our Facebook page or Instagram on EJ Investments. EJ Investments, we are first in properties. Islamic microfinance is becoming an increasingly popular mechanism for poverty alleviation, especially for developing countries around the world. This microfinance service adheres to the principles of Islam as a form of social responsibility. Yona Islamic Microfinance is the Islamic microfinance of choice in the Gambia, trustworthy and reliable. At Yona Islamic Microfinance, we provide savings products, current accounts, financing products in conformity with Islam. In addition, Yona Islamic Microfinance also offers local and international remittances, takaful fund, management of zakat, management of awqaf, trading and investment, and building of strategic partnerships to bring financial services to the doorstep of the poor with donor projects, madrasas, youth organizations, women groups, and farmer organizations. Make a choice with Yona Islamic Microfinance today. For more information on Yona Islamic Microfinance, call 377-2151 or 9832-151 or visit Yona Head Office at Tipa Garage, Bakote or visit any Yona branch located countrywide near you. your way every Saturday at about this time. This week, the much talk about report of the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation 
Commission of the Gambia has now been made public knowledge by the Minister of Justice Daudaba at a ceremony at the Sadaudaba Kairaba Jawara Conference Center. We're going to have a look today into all the issues that, or at least, of course, the most important issues that we can deal with in this one hour or so. And with me in the studio to do that, he's on the far right of your screen, Sally Utal. He is the president of the Gambia Bar Association. And next to him, Demba Ali Jao, veteran journalist. And we have Seth Mati Jao, lecturer at the University of the Gambia. Gentlemen, welcome to the brunch. Now, what else to talk about but the much-awaited TRRC report? Now, over the last three years or so, all of us have been glued one day or two, perhaps, or even more to our television as uh, the Gambia looked into the allegations that, and of course, things that have happened under former President Yaya Jame, uh, who for 22 years have run tyranny, some will call it a reign of terror, where people get killed, others disappeared, others were tortured and illegally detained. Now, a whole comprehensive report was prepared by the Commission after three years or so, and after well over 300 witnesses have testified. For the first time yesterday, the public had a glimpse of uh, what has been discovered and what the recommendations, who is responsible for what, perhaps more importantly, all were revealed. In fact, you can access them yourself when you go to the ministry's website at uh, moj.gm, moj.gm, and you go to TRC reports, you will see it. Gentlemen, welcome. Set. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Dear Salu, let me start, begin uh, with Salu Tal. Uh, you were in the hall when the minister and the whole proceedings started. Before we bring the minister's background to the ceremony, did you expect the TRS's report this soon? Um, yes, actually, I, 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 I believe that um, the report um, would come out as, I mean, you know, like, like the minister told us, because we uh, as civil society and the Bar Association have been, have had very close um, dealings um, with the minister and the minister of justice and, and his team, and also the TRRC, and um, uh, by all indication, uh, the minister promised that he will uh, ensure that the report is out within the within the time mandated by law, and as promised, he delivered. Which is one month after it's been presented to the president. Yes, because that, that is a legal requirement of law. So, and I and I, I I have no reason to believe that the minister would flout the law. The law. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I wasn't surprised at all that the report came uh, yesterday. You are yesterday. Now, throughout the process. Uh, before now, um, there have been a many school of thoughts and you know about how the government's attitude had been towards this report. You remember, it should have long been presented, it wasn't presented. Uh, there were two <laughs> occasions when it was supposed to happen, but the government insisted that everything had to be completed before it can be handed over. Even though uh, uh, there are indications that what had been ready was enough for them to have an idea of what was recommended. People said the government was playing time so because they knew it would be a hot political potato in their hands in the run up to the elections. <laughs> Doesn't it seem now that the government, after winning the elections, no longer have any reason to f you know, drag their feet on this matter? That's why we are seeing all this transparency and you know fast, you know fast uh, movement on the side of the <laughs> report. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't like to um, be drawn into. Um, political inferences. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I draw a conclusion based on actuals. Okay. And my, maybe the political scientists can throw some <laughs> light later on. <laughs> okay. But um, where I sit, I, I, as a matter of fact, um, the, we have had very, as I said before, we, we interact uh, with the government through the Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. And through our dealings um, with the Minister of Justice and the, the technical team, mm -hmm. we I mean, it has always been in good faith. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I can only speak on what I know. Okay. I cannot speculate. And as a matter of fact, the delays 
in the report has nothing to do with the government. Mm. In fact, at the last instance, we, our civil society, myself and John, had to actually go in there to find out why there was a delay. And absolutely, it had nothing to do with the government because the, gov the TRRC was set up to be independent and they were doing their work. But I think the workload was a lot more than expected. Mm. Obviously, they had challenges to finish the report and then the, uh, from the minister had to go in, speak to them, and also extended the mandate twice and also gave them the funds required. And we also went in to find out because we want to know before we start speaking in the press or speculating. Mm -hmm. we, went, we went there and actually spoke to the commissions and spoke to the Minister of Justice. Okay. All the parties concerned, we spoke to them directly. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt that the delay was not on the side of the government. They just needed more time to complete. And I think it is also better to have a complete report mm -hmm. than a partially complete report. Ah. So I think right now we should move away from the blame game okay. and focus on the substance of the report. Okay. And the process. And the substance and the process is what we're going to discuss yes, thank you. much in detail when we come back. Yao, um, mm -hmm. were you expecting this report any earlier or sooner than you that it actually happened? Um, personally, I knew that the government was not keen in getting the report before the elections. But immediately after the elections, I, I thought you know they would do whatever is possible to, to get it out. So it was not a big surprise to me that it came out. Why do you time. think it was difficult for the government to speed up the matters before the elections? Well, just as uh, Sal said, um, uh, we cannot blame the government for the, uh, the delay in the submission of the report. Mm. That is entirely under the purview of the TRRC. So whatever blame, if there is any, should go to the TRRC, definitely not to the government. But as I said, uh, it was a very hot cake to handle before the elections. If the government were to, I mean, maybe get the report well before the elections, as as he said, they were required to uh, make it public by at least within a month. And, you know, they could have, if uh, they, they had done it before the election, probably it can have some, you know, political connotations or something. Because some of the people um, who have been found wanting in the, in the report are actually queuing behind President Barrow, you know, and um, so it could have some negative uh, political connotations as far as the NPP is concerned. Yeah. Well, we will come to the nitty gritties in the report. Yeah. Wow, let's, let's look at, let's turn to the political animal in the studio. <laughs> An uh, analyst. Analyst, animal mm -hmm. as well. Not animal, <laughs> analyst. No, yes, anim I, I, well, uh, I'll defend him, An analyst. Yeah, all animals. Seth, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, Seth, could you divorce uh -huh. politics completely out of this process up to now? I mean, no. I mean, the, the, the process itself is a political process. Yeah, well, and, yes. and, and I think um, that has been the discussion from the onset. Yeah. Um, that's why you also see some people supporting and others not supporting. Absolutely. Some that are not supporting are doing in terms of political lines. Those that are also supporting. I mean, to a large extent, of course, we know that the issues of human rights violation has been central. But of course, you see also... Um, you know, the decisions that have been taken are also political decisions. For instance, why did we start in 1994 and not 1981 or 1965, for okay. instance? These are points that um, have been, you know, entirely political. And, and of course, TRRCs generally are also political decisions that, um, that needs to be taken by any government. Yeah, so, no, I don't, I don't see any, I mean, I mean, distancing politics from, from the process because the entire process, our entire existence is politics as well. I have, to, I have to disagree with, uh, with my uh, lecturer. Why? Why? I agree uh -huh. that you can't divorce politics from it, yeah. and it is also a political process, mm -hmm. but it's not exclusive a political process. Mm -hmm. There's a political process, there's a, there's a legal process, mm -hmm. there's other processes involved. Yeah. Of course, politics is central to it. Yeah, so I don't want, I mean, so... People and, driving and it are politicians, people who want to make no, sure to so it. Oh, so hang on, let's just be, let's, let's zero in. Okay. People driving what? Remember. No. Yes, an act was passed by parliament who yeah. are politicians. Mm -hmm. A commission was selected who are not politicians. Yes. The people who, who actually did, made the recommendations mm -hmm. are not politicians. And I don't think mm -hmm. they, they took into account or should take into account political consideration. <laughs> I mean, so, for, so, so there's a political element in it mm -hmm. which we cannot avoid. It's, right. and it's inherent. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. But it's political and also it's, a, it's an intersection of different elements mm -hmm. yeah. because we, when, it, when you say political the way people look at it it, it lacks a, a sense of objectivity in it because mm -hmm. political is yeah, kind exactly. of yeah but it's always part yeah but there's the end of the day for example 
um, after the report is out, I mean, we, I, we believe that they looked at it objectively and came up with a recommendation based on empirical evidence and data. That's not a political process. Mm -hmm. That's analysis. Exactly. And they made recommendations based on what they believe and on, on, on they have legal advice. advice that. Now, when that, ad, when that document goes to the government, we expect, even though they are, I mean, the, I mean we, uh, we expect the government to look at it strictly as much as possible within the lens of what is good for Gambia. Mm -hmm. Of course, you cannot divorce politics entirely. Mm -hmm. But to say it's political, I think also would make when it's political, you have choices yeah, what to do, what not to do to win yeah, votes. I mean, so, and I, so, so I think I think we need to we need to also um, qualify that. Mm -hmm. for, I mean, at least yeah. let's qualify mm -hmm. it. Yeah, okay. it, yeah, it, 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 ha it is political, yeah. but not exclusively political. That's, that's just the point I want to qualify. Yeah, I, th I think for me, where I was driving at is the, like, the decision making process of it all. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you're asking in terms of the entire. I mean, the entire process. Of course, as Sal said. Even the commissioners themselves, they are not political. But of course, when you look at the idea of the TRRC itself, that's a decision. That's a policy decision that has been undertaken by a government. There could have been another option to say, let's just go and prosecute all the people that we wanted. That will still be a political decision. Okay. So we're speaking, I'm speaking from that, I mean, the, init the initial idea yeah. and all the way, even now where we get to the to the report now, where the independent commission has done its work, done well. you know, we will also try, we will also be expecting to see politics also playing okay. in terms of so what, what would the government want to do how are they going to address the issues so and all those things? But, but I, I think both of you are talking about. Yeah, yeah we are the same. No, he's my senior. So <laughs> there is a political element to it, and there is something else much more than politics Thank in you. it as well. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the conference center yesterday and just uh, listen to the minister briefly. Uh, uh, you know how he set the scene. Uh, you know uh, when everybody actually was seated and. Uh, waiting anxiously to what will come. This is what uh, the Honorable Minister Dawda Jalo had to say. We, I think, are all, as of now, familiar with the background to the whole of the TRRC uh, concept. Um, since this government came into power in January 2017, the Ministry of Justice led a consultative process that informed the need to set up a body that will look at what transpired uh, during the immediate past 22 years rule of the former president, Yahya Jame. Um, Consultations were done locally extensively, national conferences were organized, and study tours were conducted to go to the sub region and even beyond to study what is suitable for our context. And in 2017, it all culminated into the passing of the TRRC Act in December, and then we gave birth to the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparation Commission, as we know, all know it. The <clears throat> setting of this process couldn't have been successfully done without the support of our key partners. And before we proceed, we have to return gratitude to all and sundry who have supported the Gambia in going through this transitional justice phase of our history, but particularly in supporting the establishment of the TRRC, but also supporting the process even after establishment, right through to this moment where we are. If I want to name, I probably would no doubt omit some very key partners who played an important role in this endeavor. However, the UN system is very prominent in this, right from the UN Peace Building Commission in New York, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Dakar, or of course, other civil society, whether in the form of NGOs, local and international, or in the form of local civil society organizations, and state institutions also. So I will avoid listing, but we are grateful to all our development partners, 
local and international, bilateral or multilateral, for having supported us through this process. Of course, we also need to pay special gratitude to the commissioners themselves, the eleven commissioners that accepted to take up the assignment and do the difficult task which spanned close to almost three years of a lot of hard work with their staff and the commission. They did a great sacrifice for the country and uh, their work of course is evidence in the report that is about to go public. It took them nearly three years a lot of hard work and sacrifice um, to unearth the atrocities that were committed in this country. They had over 870 days of hearing. That's quite a lot. And they had from over 390 witnesses. So it's a great to sit down and even listen to these witnesses alone on a daily basis for long hours. And in some cases, they were very emotional uh, stories they have to endure to listen to. Uh, it's, it, it wasn't an easy task. So, on behalf of the government of the Gambia, we're grateful to Chairman Dr. Cise and all the other commissioners, as well as all their staff that supported the work of the Commission. On the 25th of November, the Commission submitted its report to the President. And um, it is a requirement under Section 30 of the TRLC Act that within one month of submission of the report, the President shall submit the report to some named institutions in the Act, including the Speaker of the National Assembly, the United Nations Secretary General, and any other person deemed necessary. We could have chosen to only comply with the letter of the law and just say we probably two, three names or institutions that were named in the Act. But we know the, we're quite aware of the interest the general public has in this report. So the Ministry of Justice decided, instead of just sending the few copies to the few names that have been listed in the Act, we could rather not just make the report public for the entire public to have access to it, um, to take a look at it, and then we will move from there. We would like to, from the onset, assure Gambians first and foremost, and friends and partners of the Gambia, that this government is committed to implementing the report of the Commission. However, you will all be aware the report is being studied and the um, government will publish a white paper, hopefully five months from now. <coughs> because the provision is six months, but one month has already elapsed from the time of submission. So we have about five months to go to study the report and publish a white paper that will inform the general public as to the position of the government on the report, which includes the findings and recommendation. So this, I will leave the rest to the final part of my statement where I'm probably I will inform you of what are the next steps from now on. <coughs> At this stage, probably we can just go to what brought us here. That is the symbolic presentation 
of the reports themselves to the chosen institutions uh, or their represent and their representatives. We do not have enough enough hard copies, but we intend to upload the report on our website immediately after this ceremony. So those who may not be able to grab a hard copy will be able to get a soft copy and for your, for your own use. Uh, right, the Honorable Daude Jallo, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice uh, at the Caraba Conference Center yesterday when he was uh, presenting the report, he started uh, by staging the background uh, as to when the TRRC was formed, what had happened over the last uh, couple of years and up to the point. But he made one thing that uh, I came out with. He said the government is committed, uh, and he has told international and local stakeholders that uh, the government is committed to ensuring that the uh, recommendations are implemented. So, um, I don't want to restrict each, you know, all of us to uh, one topic, so I would like uh, you to come out with what stands out as remarkable for you in the reports and the recommendations. Where do you want to start? Well, there are, uh, we, we will, later in the program, we will have one Mr. Ta, who is the Director of Civil Litigation at the Ministry, to read out also the criminal liabilities, etc., uh, which already generated a lot of topic. But what stood out for you yesterday from the report? Did you think the Commission had done tremendously uh, well, or where you think the government needs to work hard to implement, or where do you think they will have challenges to implement? I mean, I, it's, it's a very, it's a difficult and easy question mm -hmm. because I think um, the report actually exceeded my expectations. Really? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, the report really didn't leave any stone unturned. Mm -hmm. I mean, it basically, in my humble opinion, uh, really, um, I mean, recommended that from those from the very top, mm -hmm. That is starting from the ex former president. To anybody who, who partook, conspired, enabled, I mean, directly or by, by action or by the omission, through the institutions or otherwise, in the commission of very serious crimes um, against Gambians and non Gambians. And what is beautiful about the report is, is it was done in a in a, they have, I think, are seven thematic areas, yes. seven thematic areas, mm -hmm. and also in, within different. I mean, they, they look, if you look at the genesis, starting from soldiers with a difference mm -hmm. to uh, the November 11 coup right. to the Cold season. I mean, it, 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 it is it is beautifully laid out, mm -hmm. and it gives you a, a, a picture mm -hmm. of what government went through mm -hmm. for 22 years, mm -hmm. and 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 detailed analysis of. I mean, a lot of, I mean, 800, over 871 day, days, days, of, so. days of hearing, yeah. not, not just, just actual public hearings. Yeah. And every important aspect mm -hmm. of the Gambia in terms of, uh, I mean, our country mm -hmm. during the trip was, has been analyzed mm -hmm. and recommendations have been made, I mean, to, as to those who are responsible and those who may not be responsible, but I mean, and also, I mean, recommendations on how to mitigate or prevent the occurrence of these issues. So there's a lot of um, issues on institutional reform, for example, reform as to even the PIU on crowd control, on the, on the NIA, on how they need training. And I mean, and so many other areas. I mean, I, for me, it's like I'm just digesting it because I just got it yesterday and it's a big document. So I think, I think overall, really, it does a really good job of I mean, giving a historical account of what happened, which is the truth, which is the truth, which is the first thing, and then also recommends how do we move from the truth to ensuring we we uh, we uh, we have reconciliation, we have reparation, also have justice. All those things are actually document documented, and also how do we fix the system? Because when you say never again, yeah. you you need to make sure that you look at the reasons why we why what happened happened in those days yeah. and how we can prevent its recurrence mm -hmm. so that it is in our culture that this must never happen again so it's not just a byword or a slogan or a hashtag mm -hmm. so I think it, it has and I think it's a it would be it would be a continuous process mm -hmm. I think there's even I read that there's even uh, 
a provision for peace and reconciliation commission mm -hmm. inside because mm -hmm. the most important thing is after having found the truth having had justice we need to reconcile the country and that is a, that's a marathon that's a long-term game because, because what caused it is structural and it mm -hmm. goes for two decades of process so you will need a process of how mm -hmm. do we cohere and coexist and come together as a country and that is a long term thing and I, I think I think it's really it's a it's an amazing it's not I mean it's for me I mean I can speak about it forever <laughs> it is. but I think I think they did an outstanding job yeah I mean of course you know it's not perfect and with time we also have to look at what is mm -hmm. good about it and what could be better about it you know and but overall I think really it will give governments the chance to revisit the past and with a view to build our future Yao, how did you see the report we will come to the the other interesting details <laughs> who's responding to what, what yeah just like sal said i think it was very comprehensive mm -hmm. it's quite comprehensive and uh, you know it's uh, kind of takes care of a lot of things that people expected it to contain mm -hmm. um uh, although i mean a bit concerned well i uh, i have not had the time to go over the whole document so i don't know what um, the the executive of summary well i've seen the executive summary by the uh, justice minister but um i think there is a for example, giving the government the option to, I mean, to kind of amnesty, to give amnesty to some of those people who uh, bore the greatest responsibility. Well, some some people actually, some who have been adversely mentioned on it. I think it's a bit too wide. Giving the government that uh, option, I think, we I think, I think if I understand it, what, yeah. what it said was um, the people who have been adversely mentioned mm -hmm. have two weeks to apply to apply for. Uh, amnesty yeah. again through the TRRC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who will then recommend to government I who see. among these people can have amnesty and not and why. Then, based on that recommendation, okay. the government will okay. Then as, I, as I said, uh, okay. I'm, 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 but, but just to allay your face, yes, it's also clear that there's some crimes that you cannot be granted yeah, amnesty that's right. for. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, I mean, there are ones that yeah, certain international crimes, certain crimes yeah, like torture and. Mother and yeah, you know, that, one, that one you can't negotiable. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even the, it was actually it's clearly stated that yeah, there's right. some things that even the government cannot, cannot grant amnesty for. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, there is another aspect That's also. There are some of those people who have been adversely mentioned and they are not in this country. A good example is here, Jami, he's up there. Whether the TRRC has recommended ways and means of getting hold of those people, I'm not sure whether it's contained in, in the report. But well, the minister are, actually talked about uh, that uh, they, they have been working. Uh, with international people to put in place how those uh, trials or what if they are going to be that how they will whether they will be domestic or they will be maybe maybe I could just yes comment. you can comment. Yeah. I mean you have to look at the PRC had a, has a mandate mm -hmm. the mandate is limited to I mean a specified in the act to find out who did what mm -hmm. and uh, basically who establish the, 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 the historical record the truth and recommend and rec make recommendations mm -hmm. now recommendation as to these are very technical legal issues mm -hmm. and I'm, sure, I'm not sure the commission is our best place to deal with it mm -hmm. now after the report is done it is the government of the gambia i mean after the white paper we will sit down mainly to the minister of justice to look at what is the mechanism of course i mean extradition is one thing but before we go that's why i, I was here last time with exactly. yeah. i mean the, i mean yeah. even, even yeah. in the report they mentioned yeah. the possible ways of trying um these um the, the people who have found one thing i mean either local international or hybrid I think exactly. so, but I don't want to get too much. But uh, when it, when we get to that, yeah, bridge, the minister was talking. Yeah, I think in yeah. fact we have there's a lot of work going on already mm -hmm. between Gambia and partners, and we are involved in at, okay. at, at all levels. Yeah. So I think that should not be a problem. That's why actually one of the one of the th things we've been pushing is for a hybrid court mm -hmm. that is attached to ECOWAS with a with a treaty like yeah. the hybrid, so that it's it is now ECOWAS who's asking, ECOWAS who's asking for Jammeh, not, not Gambia. That will have if ECOWAS and AU ask for. Jamie, yeah. it's easier for Obiyan to oblige oh, than, than so Gambia. Than Gambia asking. Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, I, agree, I agree. Okay. Um, as you said, the com report is very comprehensive. Again, what we are concerned is that whether the government has the political will to actually implement it together. We are, I mean, uh, we've heard that the Justice Minister say that the government is committed to it. Let's hope and pray that, you know, they would actually do it. That way, because that is important as well. If the political will is there, mm -hmm. then I think the I mean, well, you don't something think, positive uh, can come out. You don't think the well, the seemingly lukewarm attitude they adopted in the run-up to the elections at the TRRC is dramatically changed now. You see, the, the, the way the the, the the transparent nature of things now, 
got you have the impression that the government no longer have any reason uh, you know to 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 drag their feet on anything they've been well, very uh, transparent uh, yesterday yeah of course I, I agree i mean certain things have changed yes. a good example is that we all heard about what the stand of the APRC, which is a very important faction of the government yes, right yes, now. Yes. I mean, that is the uh, NP uh, Barrow's uh, yes. victory. Mm -hmm. And um, we heard what um, their stand was. They were completely against a uh, the PRRC and anything to do yeah, with it. Right. But, you know, suddenly during the campaign, I think the situation changed. <laughs> because we heard what Babi Liman's uh, you know, position was, and, you know, and uh, it kind of changed the perception and uh, even the um, the uh, you know, uh, some of those people in the APRC saw him as the supreme leader, and then suddenly, after his position was known, they kind of distanced themselves from him somehow. So probably so, that so has also changed the trajectory of their thinking. Maybe I would put that additional question <laughs> to the political scientists <laughs> anyway. here. Uh, yes. yes, what's your impression of the report? Sir? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I will agree with um, both Sal and um, Honorable here yeah. that I mean, I think the you know, first to congratulate the TRRC. I mean, they have done a very, very good job. And I think the report, I mean, for me, I think it has been, is long overdue. Um, and now that we're finally getting it, the only problem, like, it is disturbing our Christmas. We were supposed to be, <laughs> <laughs> we were supposed to be relaxing, but, you know, we've been busy, I, I mean, reading through it and, and, and all that. So, so generally, I've been, you know, really, really impressed with it all. Um, but just to say that for me, the TRRC is just a conversation starter. It, it, it basically started a conversation yes. about, I mean, like Sal said, revisiting our past, but also how do we move forward? And I think that's the job that they have done, and they have released that in about 16 volumes. Um, and, and I think it is our turn as citizens to, you know, dive in and then look at what it has presented and see you know what government is gonna do and i mean the report is not only for government mm -hmm. let's 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 take that because civil society has a role because there are certain aspects um that civil society needs to come in there are other aspects that also maybe will you know require international support and all that but generally i've been i've been impressed um but more folk i mean i i, I my, my interest in the entire process has been you know what will happen to the victim i mean and also what sort of in institutional mechanisms should we I mean, get moving forward because, like I said, it's a conversation starter. And and I read the chapter on reparations, mm -hmm. and I I think that was really good. Um, it 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 kind of you know provided a framework to on which you know moving forward how victims are going to be um, compensated, restituted, and all the other aspects that are, are necessary because reparation in, in itself is a part of justice. It's Excellent. part of the justice system that we need to look at. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I've been really impressed even though the work has been laid. And I think that's why I also say, um, and we've also had the plans that government has that, that they're committed to reparation, talking mm -hmm. even about mm -hmm. establishing a, a, an a committee, committee yeah, exactly. that is gonna be responsible for that. So I'm, I'm really impressed in that. Mm -hmm. Because why reparation? Because most countries that have undergone truth commissions, I mean, hardly pay reparations. Yes. And if Gambia is taking that, it's this is the first one. Yeah, yeah. it's the first year that actually exactly. has reparations. Exactly. Yes. yes. And and so the other day I was at a you know meeting with Ecowas and we we having this debate about you know paying reparation, the complications and all those different stuff. Whether we'll be able to pay all the victims that have been I um, mean been affected and whether even this you know practice within this country can be you know um, replicated. Yeah, replicated in, in in other parts. So I'm I'm really impressed in that. And of course, the the different institutional you know reforms um, that have been um, you know advanced, like the NIA, the prison Presents. service, mm -hmm. even the junglers. That's why I also say one of the limitations, perhaps, of the institutional hearing mm -hmm. um, could be that they needed to hear from the military mm -hmm. as a whole because they only look at the jungler part mm -hmm. and we miss the institutional setting of the military oh, to yeah. a large extent and i think there has been a missing missing element that could have been mm -hmm. added but like i said they have started a conversation mm -hmm. and i think even civil society could run with this report and then to start to engage more deeply mm -hmm. in these different conversations that it has started so I, I i like that aspect i mean and i think um you know i mean there's a lot of work that needs to be done and, and, and the one within the NIA even, you know, calling for training and specific training, training in human rights and all those things. And I think that also requires, 
I mean, a direct connection with what the security sector reform is supposed to be doing in terms of orienting um, the, the, the the security forces and the, the soldiers to be in line with democratic norms. But I think also, I mean, part of the recommendation should have been to to the civilian authority because usually it is the civilian authority that abuse this institution. Yeah. I mean, because of course the laws, and I think that's one of the, one of the recommendation, the Public Order Act, and also you know some of the other laws that are um, impeding or not you know relevant in a democratic society to be to be to be removed because the civil authorities usually tend to use i mean these um, state institutions for their own for exactly. their own advances and i think they also need to be need to be also factored in the process so yeah i'm i'm, I'm really happy with that Good. the general satisfaction with the amount of work and uh, that has been done to produce the document so kudos there to dr Tise and uh, sr fall and others now we we'll go back to the conference center because this is where <laughs> the most interesting thing happened. That is uh, where we, you know, learned about who was responsible for what, and um, you know, for the first time yesterday, um, we we now know, uh, you know, the identities of people uh, who have been found by the committee, uh, the commission to have. Uh, been involved directly or indirectly uh, through this in this in the commission of these crimes um, that has been investigated. So we will go to uh, the Ministry of Justice and the Director of Civil Litigation, Mr. Ta, uh, and you know listen to him uh, as to who bears the criminal responsibility for the crimes. The TRC's findings with regards to criminal liability for human rights violations and abuses are as follows. All the members of the junta, comprising Lieutenant Yaya AJJ Jame, Lieutenant Sana B. Sabali, Lieutenant Edward Singate, Lieutenant Said Haidara, Lieutenant Yankuba Ture, and Lieutenant Peter Singate, including their oddlies, Private Babu Kanjai, aka Njai Ponkal, JCB Mendi, Mustafa Ture, aka Churo, Lamin Marong, Lamin Sengo, a.k.a. Pasengo, or Assassin, Private Zakaria Dabo, Ensa Mendi, and Jali Madiso, are responsible for the torture and inhumane treatment of Captain Mama Cham, AIG Ebrahim Chongan, and RSM Babuka Jeng at Mile 2 Central Prisons on September 6, 1994. 2. Sana Sabali and JCB Mendi are responsible for the torture of political prisoners after the 1994 coup, particularly O.J. Jalo. Yaya Jame also bears criminal responsibility for these crimes due to his failure as Commander-in-Chief to investigate and punish the perpetrators. Three, Captain Yaya Jame, Captain Sana Sabali, Captain Edward Singate, Captain Saeed Buhairara, Captain Yanko Baturi, Captain Peter Singate, and Major Babuka Jata, together with their oddlies, and security guards are responsible for the torture and inhumane treatment of soldiers arrested and detained at Yundum Barracks on November 11, 1994, and also for unlawfully killing Lieutenant Jibril Say, Lieutenant Abdullah Ba, Lieutenant Bakari Mane, aka Nyancho, Lieutenant Buba Jame, Lieutenant Momodo Lamindabo, Cadet Amadumbake Sila, Lieutenant Abdullah Dotfal, Lieutenant Basiru Baro, Fafa Nyang, Sergeant Basiru Kamara, and E.M. Sise. 4. Captain Yaya Jame, Captain Edward Singate, together with the Odlis and security guards, including Alaji Martin and Lamin Sengo, are responsible for the unlawful arrest, unlawful detention, imprisonment, torture, and sexual violence of Sana Sabali and Said Haidara. Captain Yaya Jame and Captain Edward Singate are also responsible for the unlawful killing of Said Haidara. 5. Captain Yaya Jame, Captain Edward Singate, Captain Yanko Baturi, Captain Peter Singate, Private Alaji Kanyi, Private BK Jata, and Private Pa Aliu Gomez are responsible for the unlawful killing of Usman Koro Sise. 6. Captain Yaya Jame and his state guard personnel, including Alma Momane, deceased, Bubaka Ba, 
Musa Jame alias Malia Mungo, deceased, Sergeant Gomez alias Hitler, and Kausu Kamara alias Bombardier were responsible for the persecution, sexual violence, and torture of PP, PPP supporters, particularly OJ Jalo, Hussein Unjai, and MC Cham, who were arrested, mistreated, and unlawfully detained at Fajara Barracks in 1995 and 1996. As leaders of the group that went to the bridge, Edo Tsingate, Yanko Bature, and Peter Singate are responsible for the tortures of scores and the murder of two UDP supporters around Denton Bridge in Banjul sometime in December 1996. Yaya Jame also bears responsibility for these serious crimes of unlawful killings, persecution, torture, and inhumane treatment of UDP supporters at the Denton Bridge in December 1996 due to failure to prosecute. Yaya Jame is responsible for the persecution of Gambian journalists between 1994 to January 2017 by unlawfully arresting, harassing, detaining, deporting, torturing, forcing them into exile, killing, and disappearing them. 9. Yaya Jame, former Vice President Aisa Tunjai Sedi, and heads of the security agencies, including Babuka Jata, former Chief of Defense Staff, Usman Baje, former Minister of Interior, Babu Kaso, former Crime Management Coordinator of the Police, and Momodu Sise of the PIU, along with Abdun Jai, alias Giri, Gorgim Bup, Inspector Dabo, Modulamin Fati, Abdullah Ba, Modu Cham, Modu Gajaga, Corporal Lamin Kamara, Captain Wasa Kamara, all bear responsibilities for the killing of 17 civilians on April 10th and 11, 2000. Then, Yaya Jame bears responsibility for the killing of both Almamo Mane and Momodu Dumbuya. 11. Yaya Jame, Dumbul Tamba, Aliu Jeng, Sana Manjang, Malik Jata, Manlafi Kor, Kausul Kamara, aka Bombardier, and Bailo are responsible for the killing of journalist Deda Haidara. 11. Yaya Jame, Usman Sonko, Tumbul Tamba, Suleiman Baje, and Bailo are responsible for the attempted murder of lawyer Usman Sila. 12. Eya Jame, Tumbul Tamba, Malik Jata, Solo Bojang, Sanamanjang, and Alio Jeng are responsible for the killing of Dauda Nyasi. 14. Eya Jame, Tumbul Tamba, Solo Bojang, Malik Jata, Sana Manjang, and Alio Jeng are responsible for the killing of Ndongo Buk and disappearance of Momodo Laminyasi and Bubar Sanyang. 15. The perpetrators of the unlawful killing of Haruna Jame and Jasa Jakujabi are Yaya Jame, Tumbul Tamba, Solo Bojang, Sana Manjang, Omar Jalo, aka Oya, and Alio Jeng. 15, 16, Yaya Jame, Tumbul Tamba, Solo Bojang, Seni Jame, Yusuf Asane, Omar Jalo, aka Oya, Bora Koli, Michael Korea, Sana Manjang, Michael Jata, Fansu, Nya, Fansu Nyabali, Mustafa Sane, Ismaila Jame, and Alio Jeng, are responsible for the unlawful killings of Daba Marena, Manlafi Kor, Ebolo, Alpha Ba, Alio Sise, Masi Jame, and Julia Mako. Yaya Jame and the junglers, comprising Sana Manjang, Musa Jame, and Suleiman Sambu, are responsible for the killing of Kajali Jame, Yamakoli, Baidam, She Fal. Well, just, that is just a, a tip of uh, uh, the portion that deals with the criminal liability of some of the crimes that have been investigated by the Commission. You had uh, the Director of Civil Litigation, uh, Mr. Kimberly, da, I believe, reading um, uh, those, uh, that long list, actually, of uh, people responsible for 
one thing or the other. The list went on up to 25, I think. And it dealt with you know, all, almost all the major um, human rights violations, um, gentlemen, that we you know, have been talking about you know, from, from 1994 onwards. Um, Salih. Uh, let me begin by asking you, um, in all these things, almost everything, uh, the name Yaya Jami popped up, of course. Um, at the beginning, you know, you had people saying that, well, ah, could it be that Yaya Jami actually sanctioned all these uh, allegations they're talking about? But this, com this report seemed to be very clear as to who is responsible for what. Are you surprised that Jami almost involved in all these things? Um, is that a question? <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think I even Stephen Wonder could see that. I mean, I mean, how could um, yeah, Yajame be president for 22 years yeah. and he had absolute control of the country? It's, you know, Yajame's background is military, I mean, military security, so he's intelligent, he's very, he knows, that's, that's his expertise. He built the security apparatus around himself. I mean, he knew whatever was doing, I mean, he... I mean, so in 22 years, he was absolutely in charge of every single sector in the country. And all these things happened under his watch, not to mention the creation of a, of a, of a, of a, of a killing squad outside the, I mean, the, the, the system. Obviously, I mean, it, it is only ordinary and normal for Yaya to be responsible. I think people are denying for the reasons best known to them. So, and I think, so for me, I mean, I've always said that you either want to believe your truth or imagine your own truth. But it's very, very clear. I mean, even between the report, I mean, people like, well, I had no doubt that Jamie is responsible. Absolutely. And people have come and said he's responsible. So for me, I don't think, I never, I, I was, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the least surprised. I mean, I'm not the least su surprised that, I mean, his name featured prominently uh, in the list. Going through the list, there, are, there have been cases, some of them are, like a question I put at least to the uh, to the minister, that some of them names are actually people who are serving, you know, in, in institutions. Because if you look at the other recommendations elsewhere, there are names of people who are serving in senior positions. Yes. And I asked the minister about it. He said, "Well, yes, the government will actually address those things in the, in the immediate uh, time, the, you know, in the short time before the white paper comes out." <laughs> what do you make of that? I mean. I actually, I, I was reading the... Like the young Kuba Sonko, who, who is now... Young Kuba Sonko is the Minister of Interior. He's, he's, he's been recommended that he should not be be in position, not hold for responsibility for 10 years or so. So is Usman So, Director of NIA. Um, I mean, and, 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 and many other people, so in the police, uh, I can see the crime coordinating units, there's several names there who are still serving. This and others. Um, the minister said something will be done about it in the short time before the white paper comes. Yeah, I mean, of, I mean, I think, I think uh, the the minister and the government should do the needful, the right thing. Of anyway, f to start with, we don't even know who's going to be in cabinet. Ah, okay, in the next cabinet. Yes, that's, that's <laughs> <what> I'm, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just saying. Uh -huh. So I think uh, the president elect, uh -huh. you know, should, um, in the interest of the country, uh -huh. should do the right thing. I think anybody who's adversely mentioned, I mean, it does not mean that you are guilty. Is that there's a finding, a recommend, recommendation against you, yeah. which, I mean, even in a court, it, it may not even be the case. Yes. But in the interim, I, I think the least that can happen is for you to go on administrative leave with pay. That's my personal view. I mean, I think that is what is expected. Because if you're in a position where you could influence the outcome of Whatever investigation. Yeah, you, you, I mean, I don't, I don't think that, that, that would send a very good, strong message. I think if we were really serious about the TRRC, and mm -hmm. um, people who are adversely mentioned, I mean, even though I mean, they are not guilty, mm -hmm. I mean, this is just an allegation. I mean, it's, well, it's a finding. It's finding. a finding. Yes. Uh, and of course, the, 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 um, the threshold in a, in a true commission is not as high mm -hmm. as in a court. Okay. So, you, you, can, you I mean, it, it's a finding, it's a prima facie evidence that you've done something but if it goes to a court you will have a ch you, you will the, some of this evidence may not even stand in the court because it ha you, you, you may cross-examine it may not it may be hearsay it may not be you may not have the value it, it is required to convict 
otherwise. So I think in the interim, I mean, I would, as a lawyer, I would not say that they are guilty. I said I think there are adverse findings against them, and and in the interest of uh, ensuring that we, we maintain the the, um, the integrity of the process, mm -hmm. I think they should be. If anybody who's in government in right. any senior position yeah. should should be sent so on administrative, I mean administrative leave, leave. Mm. at least in the interim. Oh. I think I think that is the least Correct. that is expected. Are you not possible also? You see people who have actually been named in one category as people responsible, and then in other areas they themselves become victims, <laughs> <laughs> like we've seen in the yeah, like Sana Sana Sabali, <laughs> like Sana Sabali, yeah. and like, uh, how to call it the chaos of camera, chaos of cameras, bombardier, uh, bombardiers, and uh, you know. yeah, because I mean that was the that was. That was Jammeh. That was Jammeh. He will use it. Jammeh. Because he, wep he weaponized yes. um, uh, our, our security personnel. They were weapons. He will use you to do his, I mean, his dirty work, as bidding. And then when he, also when he feels like he will also victimize you. That has been the recurring trend. Mm -hmm. And I'm, not everything is even reported. That, that has yes, been his modus operandi. Yeah, that's right. Surely. Yeah. But, a, but a victim yeah. is a victim. I mean, just because <laughs> somebody is a perpetrator yeah. does not mean that they, are, they don't qualify yeah, as a victim. Exactly. That's what we've seen throughout this evening. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with Sal and the fact that um, the fact that Yaya Jami has been mentioned in virtually all these things. I mean, the, the box stops in his office. I mean, he was the he was the um, the ultimate head of whatever was happening. I'm sure some of these things were happening without his knowledge. But um, after they happened. there was okay. I mean, there was uh, it was quite obvious that he was aware of most of these things, even if they happened without his I mean, sanctioning it. But uh, there was impunity. There was an um, a, a lot of impunity in this country. He knew things have bad things have happened, yeah. and he was not taking any action whatsoever. Yeah. So I mean, that's I mean, there's no doubt that. And again, on the question of those who have been adversely mentioned and still serving, yeah. uh, I think um, some of them should not even wait for either interdiction or whatever. They should just I mean, Resign. call it quits. Resign. Honestly, that's what I think they, sh they should do. I mean, yeah. they have been adversely mentioned in some of these very I mean. Uh, horrible atrocities they should definitely leave but yeah, because the, the attitude of the government at the time right. was when people raised the question that look these people have been mentioned by witnesses and they are still serving the government said well you know they're they waiting for jump the, on people we're waiting for the TRR. They waiting. now they've now got, got is, the, yeah, no, the TRRs yes. report i think these people should also you know just do the honorable thing and, themselves. And, and leave on their own but I mean, if they don't live in their own, I think the government no, definitely should take action. We cannot wait for uh, May or whatever, six yeah. months' time to leave them still enjoying. No, no, no the no. minister said they will do something before the Yeah, I, I hope they will do it, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. yeah, I I think for me, I just want to pick up the, I mean, the government is talking about commitment, mm -hmm. commitment to implement the TRRC, and mm -hmm. we are talking about in three measures um, that people have been asking for, uh, that will also, you know, put people, I mean, or, I mean, increase people's trust even in the process or even government's commitment in, in ensuring that that um, that is done and I think therefore they need to they need to take interim measures to like like Sal suggested um, to ensure um, that those that have been mentioned um, should, should should relax and, and, and then we, we, we move but in terms of Jame you know I mean Jame Jame was the state um, basically he I mean the, the way he, he you know <laughs> Establish his own security institution, but but of course it's not only him. But you, that's why I am always interested in this institutional setups. Yeah. You know the legal frameworks, the military. He had a, you know, the hand to get right into the military, pick anybody that he wanted, has a, a power to set up his own units, and he basically did that and abused and you know beat us. But what I'm also saying that Jami was the state, therefore the state also need to take responsibility in terms of some of these issues. Because for me, I say that our process was basically. I mean, you know, state abuse. The state was basically abusing all of us in, 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 in that sense. And therefore, that, 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 that also comes with the responsibility of the state. But Jame, who was given the mandate, of course, needs to, need to pay, we need to pay attention to it. But, but, but can you, I mean, I, mean, I, I think it's, this is actually a very interesting mm -hmm. concept. I, I, I'm even asking, was there, was, there, was there, I mean, when we talk about the state, you are really talking about institution. The yeah. state is an institution. The presidency is an institution, mm -hmm. but um, the Jammeh era, the, the state didn't really exist. The state was subsu subsumed into a personality mm -hmm. okay. like Louis XVI, let us say more. Jammeh mm -hmm. was the state, yeah. yes. so so Jammeh really, Jammeh really control what 
what what the democratic I mean, institutions were just they're, they're in name. Yeah, in name. I mean, this, remember there was a time even the parliamentarians were actually thinking of making him king. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, this happened. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the, the, I mean, the state, the state institutions were paralyzed. I mean, he controlled the judiciary. He controlled the. He decided, he controlled. Yeah, who gets, he 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 could arrest you, get you prosecuted, get you locked up, in, and in, and beat you inside the prison. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he controlled. It was at all levels. He controlled everything. Everything. And anybody who acted against him, you suffered the same fate. So I think, yeah, I think it, it's important that I think Sarah Sarah Ndau mentioned it. Yeah. That at the, at the I think the state should apologize. Yes. Because yeah. I mean, because the state failed its people. A, a state's role is to protect. Yeah citizenry and the state allowed one person yeah. to effectively i mean i mean really reduce our our i mean our our, our humanity is to the that, lowest level is it that because even, and even now you can see it's just kind of backward thinking and the concept that once somebody is president his actions cannot be questioned exactly and i and i think i think um i always so that's why i was talking to one of my good old friends and look never again it's not only Never again should be a never-ending campaign, mm-hmm. in the sense that we, should, we must never elevate mm-hmm. an individual beyond the state young, or the citizen. The young, the, I, yeah. I think that is fundamental. Yeah, I think some, some those it, even if you think they are liking him to God. Yeah, but you know because I mean we are still unlearning. I use my one of my <laughs> teacher unlearning. I mean the ways of a dictator are now going into dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean in this country today, I mean Alan Burr is elected president, mm-hmm. right? So he's president for everybody. Uh, but not everybody voted for him, but we respect of his office. He has to govern. And he has to name, govern yeah, the name of everybody. everybody. Mm-hmm. And and we will hold him accountable as president for everybody. For everybody. And yes. and, and that is I mean that, that is why we I mean the bigger picture is really whether we as citizens understand our responsibility mm-hmm. as citizens and also our power as citizens. As citizens. And our servant leaders understand that we are the reason they're there. Yep. Yeah. And they need to serve us. And and if we disagree with them or the photos it mean that we don't like them we don't it's, like because them. it's the, the office the so i think and, and i that that if you want to build our country we, yeah. we need to start changing we our mindset to, yeah this is not like a football game yeah. like liverpool and <laughs> you know it's, it's it's a much bigger thing and i think it's we a, really need it's to about our lives and our, our lives and livelihood at the end of the day yeah. who i was saying that uh, whoever's president doesn't matter yeah. how are you going to change the life of that little kid in dan yeah. that's, 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 that's the question yes that's the question yeah now, did you guys see any area you think is too harsh for, for, for well, may you might not take, uh, you may not, uh, that may not obviously apply to the atrocities, the human rights atrocities, uh, the main one, but in, in the recommendations against civil servants or, you know, institutional heads, etc. Like for example, there is a recommendation of someone or group of people or categorized in some category will are uh, banned for 10 years to hold the public. I mean, if you torture somebody, if you violate people's rights, if you did not serve the or state you when you were supposed to, yeah, you cover up. You did not serve the state when you were supposed to serve. Destroy exactly. I mean, I, I mean, sometimes the you see the state is beyond all of us, and that needs to be the um, you know the message that it like when if you are given a responsibility and you're not performing and you violated the same constitution, why should you be there? In fact, I mean, for me, I don't see anything as being harsh. Ten years. We are saying public. You can go into the private sector. You can go somewhere else. But in terms of the public, where it is public office, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be there. But for me, I think you know. I mean, I, I want to limit my discussions in terms of you know the the recommendations, the findings, because at some point, you know, I'm just go, we're gonna get into the report. We might disagree with some of the findings. We yes. might you know yes. create some other sort of discussions around it. And I think it's important. Like I said, that the the, the report is out. It's a conversation starter. We must discuss about it. And the discussions around what sort of a narrative moving forward um you know that should be created for this country it it it, it has started now and i think this is this is the this is this is the beginning yeah i mean for me i, I, I agree with uh said here that um, those who are banned for 10 years i think for some of them should be banned for life i mean for taking <laughs> a, a public exactly. because they abuse yes, their public. positions they were given i mean working for the public definitely but uh, i don't think it's harsh you know i think it's okay yeah. Let's, yes, sir. I, mean, I, I speak a little word. I think, I mean, whether it's harsh or not, I mean, it's, it could be depends on yeah. how you look at it. Yeah. But um, I think, I, I, whatever we do, I think we should put it in a, we have a legal framework. Mm. That as a country says that, I mean, to be, so if you, to be a public servant, I mean, these are, these are, this is what qualifies you 
it's what disqualifies you. Yes. And and those um, those I mean people who have ever committed torture and and grave human rights abuses or I I mean have you know, really acted in a manner on becoming of a of a Gambian or a citizen. I mean, should not be allowed to serve in the public office because you're interfacing with the public. Mm -hmm. But let's couch it within uh, a legal framework. Otherwise, mm -hmm. people, lawyers will go to court and say, what is the basis of, the, of, of yeah. you <laughs> banning someone? Banning someone. They, have, they have a right to life work, to life to live. Okay. So I think, it's, but say it's for me, for me, it's, it's more about the legal framework. Mm -hmm. But I think if, if I'm sorry, I mean, if, if they are good, good, good move with all due respect, I've, having done all that, it, it really, hurts victims to see people like that yep. still walking. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, does, it doesn't insp in, inspire confidence. Like Sid said, commitment is, I mean, Minister of Justice has, you know, I mean, I mean, has said, said, said that the government is committed, and I take his word for it. But now, commitment has to be demonstrated. Mm. You have to show, not only say it, you have to yep. act it and do it. So the commitment, we're acting and we're waiting and seeing. Having government. said, having done all these steps, mm. now what are you going to do to show us? And also, like unlike my uncle yeah. we cannot pray and hope for political will right. we are demanding political, political will, will. Mm -hmm. political will politicians are politicians okay. whether they're in the gambia or in america they all political they're, they're all political experience when it comes the next election yes so yeah. we must ensure that we demand political will the trrc recommendation transcends politics partisan politics Absolutely. and we have to put it in the agenda that whoever whoever it is i mean we you must respect the report and of course, it's not possible to recommend everything to the letter. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think we have the money expectation. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, they, could, I mean they, they may look at things and have a different view. But let it be based on objective criteria, mm -hmm. not, and, or not on any personal reasons or otherwise. I mean, I think if, if it's done fairly and objectively, yeah. and I think the minister has explained, and I'm also aware of it, that there's a, because there's some funding from donors yeah. to put a team together which will help write, write the I mean, white paper. And this team would have people from within the Ministry of Justice, yeah. international experts, and also local experts. Ah. So I think that they, are now, they will now professionalize mm -hmm. the writing of the white paper. Okay. So I believe um, if that, when that happens, I think yeah. at least we have a much better chance of having a white paper that actually is would yeah. Gamis would accept. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I also think, you know, even if you look at the TRRC report on the reconciliation part, it talks about these people that are serving, mm. that have been named before. Um, it, it, you know, part of the illustration, it can add to... Um, the reconciliation aspect that we are talking about mm -hmm. um, because at some point you know when people uh, violated rights and then they are still serving mm -hmm. I mean th there needs to be a disconnect between you know the past and also the future and of course whilst having the same people continue in you know the same position yeah. I mean it doesn't tell well in terms of the disconnect and and there's a need for that um, to exist and I think the report has been able to you know I mean provide a whole framework in terms of how the government might be able to start thinking about it but also have even one that in some areas in terms of the way they do it and that's why where Sal uh, mentioned um, having a legal framework could be could be critical because in otherwise you might do it you know remove one and then the other person start asking those kind of questions and even those aspects have been considered yes. by the TRRC and I think you know that's why I said the report uh, you know has been really job. you know they've been thinking definitely many people think that uh, well they, sus they suspect the government is putting emphasis more on reparations compensation than actually uh, i mean they, they, they seem there's not they seem to be not that much commitment in terms of justice seeking for justice you agree with that now if you go back a little bit the, the minister said they are going to have um a committee that is going to be running the compensation committee, whatever it will be called. They've put $155 million already aside uh, for that. Um, they believe they will look at the TRS's guidelines for um, compensation, which was not adequate, which many victims said was too small, like a threshold of 600000 mm -hmm. for a case of murder. People believe that's too small, you know, torture, even much less. So they said they're going to have a committee that will look independently at this uh, um, recommendations reparations. to reparations and they put aside 155 million and they're going to look for more money to put in that uh, uh, in that in that uh, budget or whatsoever do you believe that uh, the government is more serious with reparations compensation than actually in pursuing justice for it I mean I, I have no I mean I think um, it's not a binary or exclusive mm -hmm. uh, I don't look at it the, I think the, the uh, it reparation is important mm -hmm. because I mean 
people have to also continue to live. There are people whose parents have been killed and they need to go to school. Mm. Mm. And in many instances, sometimes reparation is more effective. Yeah. I mean, let's say in Sierra Leone, they spend over $250 million. A million dollars. I mean, to try, I don't know, two or three people. Ah. And most of those victims, they are still... Even here, they, they spend over $100 million. Here. No, I'm coming, I'm coming. Looking for the process, no. not actually... No, that's the difference. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is, yeah. I mean, you can achieve both. Yeah. It's not mutually exclusive. Yeah. You can... Reparation is key because we're a, a very poor country. I mean, yeah. some of these people, their breadwinners were killed. Absolutely. I mean, they cannot, they, they cannot, their kids cannot go to school. Yeah. So they will. They, they end up... They lose their parents and they also remain poor and we cannot move on in their life. So I think reparation is very key to at least give fi I mean, financial stability at least to those families. I think it's very, very important. And, it's, and reparation is never enough. There's no, there's no amount of money that, that can replace a life. Let's understand that. Absolutely, it's never enough. yes. But, but justice also helps you get closure. Mm -hmm. when, when you go to court and you believe, I mean, the person who killed their parents or uncle or tortured is now uh, held accountable, it gives you closure. But what it takes to have justice is a lot more complex, complex. and, 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 and we, don't, we, we as a country don't even have the capacity to I start see, with. We don't have the capacity. We cannot do it alone. Mm. It requires international partners, international funding. There's so many things that needs to be done to, for, for it to happen. That's, that's what we've been working on for the last two years and I'm still working on it because it's a very complex yeah. issue. I mean, our laws are not adequate. I mean, I mean we, we are so close knit. There's so many, we need, even our judges need training. They've never done this type of thing before. We don't have the investigators to, to handle this forensics. Mm -hmm. a, we don't have witness protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can give you a list. Mm -hmm. It's very complex. So we need a lot of support mm -hmm. that allows us to do this as much as possible, gambinize as much as possible, and also have the international element where we are lacking. Also, you have to be fair to the, to the, to the, to the, to the people who are accused. You have to make sure that they have lawyers. Yes. You even have funds to pay for their lawyers the because they have properly rep represented. Yeah. And every day, because you have, if you're fighting injustice, yeah, you, you also have to be fair yeah, to those yeah, you are trying. Kind of so it's a, it's a very complex. I think, yeah. I mean, we are working very closely with the government, yeah. and the government has a lot of support to, to do it the right, the right way. So that's why I think they're taking their time. Even in the report, they, 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 the report did recommend the possible ways of doing it, yeah. local, international, hybrid, and so on and so forth. But that conversation is already ongoing with, with government and civil society and with our partners, and we'll continue to look at the, the, way to, the best way to do it. And I believe it will happen because it's, it's also an important component. But for the reparation, it's in their hands because they just they approve the budget. It's ah. in the, they put it in the budget. Mm -hmm. And I think that also would kind of like much, much easier. give a bit of uh, relief yeah. to, the, to, to, the the, um, to the victim. So it's a good thing, really. Yeah, Somebody, I, I, I agree with Sal. I mean, reparations is a very, very important uh, mm -hmm. element of uh, the TRRC. But there is also um, reconciliation. Mm -hmm. It's another important aspect of yep. it, you know, and justice. Mm -hmm. All those are those three elements, I think there should be a kind of a balance. But they are all important in the TRRC work and in the implementation. Yeah. I mean, for, for, can, can I, I, yeah. I think for me, I mean, like Sal said, I mean, uh, is they're all, they're all relevant and needed. In, in, in terms of what steps need to be taken uh, moving forward. Because for me, reparation has, be, I mean, through reparations, if victims are well taken care of, I mean, we might even, they might be even forgiven. I mean, they might do a lot of other stuff. And, you know, that can also help facilitate reconciliation. So reparation itself is a form of justice. Let us not, let us also not forget. Restorative justice. Re 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 yeah. Yes, it's restorative. But also in terms of the reconciliation, this is where I also still, um, you know, that's why we said the state responsibility. Uh, and, and for me, the reconciliation needs to go beyond victim, perpetrator. Yes. It has to also go between the state and society. Because like I said, it was the state that was perpetrating this. I've been saying that from the onset, and I continue to say that. And, you know, the state, how do we reconcile? the people understand how do they reconcile i mean there needs to be greater trust there needs to be increased transparency and through those things people will begin to trust the state whatever decision that they're taking they know that they have participated and then they're contributing and i think those are the ways that we need to do that when the people understand reconcile i mean because at the end of the day it also has to fall down to the economic you know to the economic aspect who gets what when and how the bread and and are, yeah the bread and butter <laughs> issues yes. and, and and that one that is one aspect that also the trc has not dealt with and i think moving forward there's the need for those socio-economic questions to be also raised as part of the uh, the discussion somebody raised a quick very important question they said well actually it's, it is related to the reparation still because we learned from the former attorney general that it would be only proper and fair if reparations come from the assets 
recovered from the sale of Jambe's yeah, properties because Jambe being, of course, the number one uh, perpetrator of these atrocities. But somebody asked this question: um, Why uh, is the government not very much accountable, to, you know, to the people about entirely what has been sold uh, from Jambe's assets? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that's a very, very important question that the people should be interested in because we, we've seen the Jambe Commission came out with recommendations as <coughs> what happens to Jame assets. But you know, the government is not coming out, you know, clearly as to how much uh, asset, what has happened to Jame's assets. Mm. It's definitely not, it's still a bit uh, cloudy, that area, I think, and the government should be a bit transparent as far as that area is concerned. And I agree with you, I mean, because uh, the Jame assets are to a very large extent tied to the atrocities that were committed. So I think most of the, if they can be able to fund the, I mean, the reparations, most of it definitely should be taken from the... When we last heard was that the former minister brought $50 million and gave it to the TRRC. That's what they use to start this reparation and, in, and you know, in kind and cash. 50 other million was promised. It was it never came. But the minister at the time said $300 million have been, you know, re re realized from the sales and put somewhere. And that money not, not has been had afterwards. Actually... Uh, from Jammes assets and then use that as promised by the former attorney general, the same government of course, that uh, it is only fair for the reparations to come from Jammes assets uh, since he was the number one uh, you know, perpetrator of these crimes. Uh, I, anyway, I, I have a different view. I think uh -huh. re reparations should come from the state. The state? Yeah. And but, but what, I, if, I'm, what I'm, if the government, what if the state I'm, that sees the... I'm coming. Mm -hmm. Now, the state has... Um, through a commission has uh, made a ruling that all jam the, uh, uh, assets of Jamie have been forfeited to the state. To the state. Okay. Right? I mean, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And from my, I, I stand corrected. I think over a billion dollars of assets have been sold. Mm -hmm. I, I stand corrected. That's the information I have. But mm -hmm. I have not seen actual documentation. Mm -hmm. I think there should be better accountability of sure. of what was sold, how it was sold, and what happened to the money. Mm -hmm. But there again, I press uh, you guys don't sometimes. Exactly. I mean. You don't. Ask, sometimes you don't ask the right questions. Oh, well, we ask. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I mean, I mean, this, this is a big uh, white yeah, elephant in the room. Absolutely. It's a big elephant, but you hardly get. Uh, I mean, these things being questioned. Well, by, and, and, and I'm coming. I, and I think these are very legitimate questions, questions to ask, even yeah. beyond the issue of reparation. Yeah. These are very. These are because these are. This belongs to us as a country. You know, that's why we don't leave the job to politicians. You know, there was a time the APRC especially the leadership that are now in Barrow's camps, where the vocal, the most vocal voices, you know, asking these questions. They have been silent, of course, for obvious reasons. But, but you when, you're, when you're you modest, you cannot talk. <laughs> yeah. That's what they, they are, say in Nigeria. They, they, they say, vocal. when you're modest, you cannot talk. Exactly. <laughs> they are yeah. the leading, you know, yeah. leading voices asking these yeah. questions. So, come to Germany. so I, think, I think... And the government at the time said they had a court order that they should stop and freeze everything. So they didn't even want to talk about it. Yeah, but, the, but the, the court has now. No, but but um, but the court order did not say you cannot talk about it. What? No, no. There was a, there were people who challenged the sale yeah. of assets. Exactly. I mean, ongoing sale of assets. Yeah. And for that reason, they stopped selling. Yes. Because they they had already sold a lot. And they appealed uh, and and won. Yes. Yes. So. So who knows? They might be selling it. You know. I, I, yes. So what I'm saying, but th 
they, could, they can still tell us what they sold. Exactly. The court didn't say, don't talk about what you sold. Yes. yes but I think, I think also we, we need to be better as civil society, for example. Yeah, exactly. We civil need to better ask also the media because, to come I mean, because the, coming we, to our end. We, we should ask the right questions exactly. and get answers. And this that's part of accountability. I mean, for, for, for me also, I think, you know, we don't even need to ask the question. Mm. I mean, because already it's a process yeah. that is ongoing. Mm. And then we promise accountability on all those different stage, issues. Yeah. At every stage, they should come out clearly and tell us, yeah. well, we have did this and that and yeah, that but, and that. But, I mean, uh, of course, I proactively, agree. yes. Yes, yes. The, all things being equal, yes. but that's not the case. Obviously, I mean, ordinarily, we expect that coming from a government that was so corrupt, and um, we, we, we elected a leader on the, on the, on the basis that, every, that he will undo those practices. And one of the first commission, before anything, mm -hmm. was anti corruption. Uh, and that, uh, that I thought I thought that was sending a message that we are going to be tough on corruption yeah. because that before constitution before TRC is yeah, yes. and I mean you know what happened to Jana corruption yeah. I mean after the report I mean white paper and then what yeah. down what, what a down <laughs> you know no. I mean so for me I mean I think I think in in this second term of government mm -hmm. I think corruption is should be one of the most mm -hmm. Most, um, most, most uh, I mean, important uh, issues. Top priority. Priority for the president to tackle. Yes, yes, tackle. Exactly. We I, need, I mean, I, I think it's very, very important because you see, corruption. I mean, it corruption. I mean, has affects people in so many different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that it is tackled and is tackled seriously. Yes. Not only okay, you can set up an anti-corruption commission, yeah. but we, we 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 must also have this concept of impunity. It, sh it shouldn't happen. We should make sure that people who, I mean, who, uh, who uh, misuse public resources should be held accountable. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will, we will just replicate everything that we've been fighting against in Germany. I agree. I with think you it's very important. I really agree with you there, Sal. I mean, I think corruption should be given a top priority as yep. far as this government is concerned. Mm -hmm. We've just recently seen the the, the audit report on the, 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 the Minister of yep. I mean, Health. Yes, damn it. I mean, and, uh, and, and everybody is saying nothing is going I mean, to come we, out. Seen, I mean, we've seen. I mean, we've seen. I mean, I mean, I mean, gum petroleum. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, gum petroleum. I mean, I mean, right. I mean, I mean, we haven't uh, got any updates. I mean, so really, I think, I think, I think they should. We should really ensure that. I mean, now that the election is it's over passed, and done, yeah. I mean, we should really focus on making sure that we are yeah, serious. Particularly, President Corruption. Barrow has been given a very strong mandate. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. I think yep. he should definitely yeah. take it head head yeah. on. Yeah, he should fight corruption. Put up a Carson very effective is, team. Is the canker, going to help canker you woman, he said. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. 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 Right, finally, uh, the government said it has one word from all of you. It has up to five months. We know, of course, that's what the constitution or whatever law um, governing it says. But don't you think, again, the government is not contemplating because the next election is at the corner, less than five months. Don't you think they, they, they are buying time? Of course, legally, they have up to five months. But, you know, the minister in his. Uh, um, in his speech yesterday, made an emphasis that 25th May is when we should actually on have the white paper. On or before. On or before. Uh, but he emphasized we have up to five months. Didn't you read or did you suspect anything from his speech that he probably might be thinking that uh, the government might be thinking to delay until after the parliamentary elections? Because they may think well, that, okay, uh, the implementation of this might affect our election chances. Again, the government is always thinking about the next election. Yeah, but it, maybe that's one aspect of it. But there is another aspect. Yes. Uh, because with the landslide victory that Barrow has scored in the presidential elections, yeah. probably the NPP is hoping that they are going to also sweep the National Assembly. And then they would have a, a, a very sympathetic National Assembly. And anything they put in there can, you know, be done in their favor. It's all possible because definitely May, you would have passed the We would have passed the elections. You know, I mean, if they manage to, I mean, to win the National Assembly elections mm. and get a majority in Parliament, mm. then everything would be smooth for them. So that is, that's another possibility. Including disregarding whatever but yeah, I mean, But I think they can <laughs> be able to do it before five months. I mean, uh, quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, for, for me, I think since they have the, the, the time, I mean, it, it wouldn't matter whether it comes in March or in, in May for me. What is important is what, I mean, what are they saying in the document? I think that's what we should focus on. Uh, whether they are taking some of the recommendations seriously, what 
what which recommendation they are picking and which they are living and and why they are living the ones that they are living is it that they are living in possible society or they're leaving it for somebody else to implement those are issues that i want to see in the in the in the, in the government white paper and 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 therefore may april june i mean no not june of course you know oh, march sure, yeah anything anytime before i think it's important that we look at that but at the end of the day what is important is that with the white paper we hold government accountable and areas where civil society and other players can play we also ensure that we we do all those things because the report is vast and has room for everybody to 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 work on finally sal from your experience you think we have to wait up to five months for a white paper now i i think what is more important is for it to be done properly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not about how i mean i mean it's a this, i mean it's a very voluminous it's a lot of work 16 uh, i mean and i mean and government even alone cannot do it yeah i mean they actually have, i mean got help from the i think u.s government mm. other other partners to have them um sift through this information and and write a white paper so i i'm not i mean i as long as it is done within the stip stipulated time frame i have no qualms about it. i think there's no need to rush uh, a white paper what is important to get a a very good white paper that when we sit here, we say, wow, this white paper actually works. Mm. Not to get a white paper in fe February and we'll say, oh, it's a wishy-washy white paper. Mm. Uh, it, this, this is missing, that's missing. Mm. So let's focus on, on, since the law says they have up to, up to. I, I would rather give, give them, them the benefit of I, the I would rather give them, I'd rather <laughs> let them do it properly. Okay. Properly, and if once it's done, we can now, we focus on scrutinizing mm -hmm. the content of the white mm -hmm. paper. Yeah. I think that's for me more important. Good. Sale Utali is the president of the Gambia Bar Association, Demba Ali Jao, veteran journalist, and Sedmati Jao, political science lecturer at the University of the Gambia. Thank you all for your perspectives on the TRC report. Remember, you can read it by yourself by going to moj.gm, moj.gm, and you have all the reports to educate yourself about it. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being on the program. We'll be back next week, inshallah. Goodbye for now. Data, now even better. Enjoy 20% extra data on all Gamcel data bundles. Buy 20 megabytes and get extra 4 megabytes. Buy 50 megabytes and get extra 10 megabytes. Buy 100 megabytes and get extra 20 megabytes. Any amount of Gamcel data bundle you buy, you will receive 20% extra data for free. Dial star 302 star. Data amount hash. Or go to your Yaibor menu and choose your data bundle now. Gamcel data is fast, last longer and very reliable. Gamsil Yaibolong. For all your pastry, bakery and quality food, CK Restaurant is the only place to be. We do catering for birthdays, weddings, and all related services. We have all kinds of local foods, American, European, and even beyond. Come and have a taste of our local juice Ebay and other services. At CK Restaurant, customer satisfaction is our priority. Planning to have an uninterrupted electricity and water supply from solar energy in the Gambia and beyond? Worry no more. Because Solar Enterprise will provide you with the solutions at reasonable cost. We have experienced personals who can install and advise you about your electricity and water supply with a warranty period. We have good quality solar products from North America and Europe. 
We provide services and sell products to individuals, organizations, institutions, private offices, communities, and government. These products are solar panels, batteries, charge controllers, inverters, water pump, water heaters, freezers, submissable pumps, and general solar accessories. Visit our stores at 48 Kairaba Avenue and Brusubi Highway, or you can call us on 7657-479-980-8483-340-9400 or 6359906. We live in a day and age where technology is creating a world without borders, filled with unlimited potential to improve the lives of the people around us. Innovarex Global Health ushers in a new way of leveling the playing field with increased access to quality healthcare services delivered at your doorstep. Our qualified professionals are equipped with state-of-the-art point-of-care testing technology to conduct tests such as kidney function, liver function, electrolyte tests, body composition, hemoglobin, A1C, and many more services with the highest efficiency in delivering results. The addition to our flagship, Wellness on Wheels, more fondly known as WOW Delivery Service, brings the entire clinical experience full circle. IGH has remained committed to creating the future of healthcare delivery. Gone are the days of sending loved ones outside the country for basic medical services. Innovarex Global Health offers a new peace of mind and takes pride in delivering the quality of care we all deserve.